How's everyone doing? Hey! I'm not going to use the mic tonight. Um, I might a little bit later. All right, so first of all, thank you very much for coming. This We are really excited to be putting on this event. This is our very first Prairie State College Faculty Showcase. And um, I'm Dave Nays. I'm Associate Dean of Academic Affairs here at Prairie State College. Um, and tonight's event, I want to make sure that I, uh, I would be remiss if I didn't mention that tonight's event is also sponsored by the Prairie State College Foundation. So we want to make sure that we give a shout out to the foundation. Let's give them a hand. We're going to hear from two incredibly talented faculty members here at Prairie State College. Let me give you a little bit of context in terms of the background behind tonight's event and some of the things regarding our faculty members that you're going to hear from in just a few minutes. And then I'm going to get off stage and get out of the way and let our students and faculty take over. Um, basically, one of the things that we really think is important here at Prairie State College is that we celebrate all Prairie State College uh, uh, employees, right? Whether they're adjunct faculty, full-time faculty, support staff, administration, so on and so forth. And so we figured we wanted to make sure that we gave our faculty a platform beyond the classroom walls. And so one of the things about both the full-time and the adjunct faculty here at Prairie State College that we're particularly proud of is that, and I'll go on record as saying this, and I know we're recording, but I'm going to go on record as saying that I will put up our full-time and our adjunct faculty at Prairie State College up against any faculty, full-time or adjunct, in the state of Illinois. <laughs> paying lip service to that. That's, that's 10 years of, of seeing this in action, seeing our faculty in action. And it's not a competition, right, going up against other faculty, but every year the Illinois Community College Trustee Association has every community college in the state of Illinois submit nominations for different awards, two of which are the Adjunct Faculty of the Year and the Full-Time Faculty of the Year. Um, tonight, who you're going to hear from in just a few minutes, is Dr. Christine Brooms, who is Associate Professor of Chemistry here at Prairie State College. She was our full-time faculty uh, nominee for full-time faculty of the year. And it's not just me talking, saying how great our faculty are. The ICCTA agreed, and for the first time in Prairie State College's history of all of our nominees, Dr. Brooms was the Illinois Award winner statewide. <laughs> Chad Belitra, who is an assistant professor of heating, ventilation, and air conditioning, um, he's no slouch either because last year he was our adjunct faculty nominee, and he's so darn good at what he does, we decided we wanted to hire him full time to coordinate our HVAC program as well as our fire science program. And that's one of the rules about working at Prairie State. You want to work here, you have to be multi-talented. So, so in Chad's case, you got to be a firefighter, a business owner, and a full-time instructor. So, uh, right? so, so in just a few moments, you're going to hear from these incredibly talented faculty. And like I said, we wanted to give them a stage to talk about whatever it is they wanted to talk about. And for selfish reasons, as a teacher myself, I just enjoy watching teachers teach. Right? And I don't really get, we don't really always get the opportunity, right? unless you're a student in that classroom, we don't, or you're observing them you know, however often, we don't typically get to see them in action. And this is our platform. This is at least one opportunity for us to bring them to everybody else beyond those walls. Okay? So we're really, really excited about that. I am not going to introduce them in full. Rather, and we had this great idea. Um, where's Sean Smith? Where's Sean? Where's Sean? Sean Smith had this great idea, and he said, you know what, we've got this great idea for allowing faculty a platform with this event. Um, what about students? Because typically with students, we get to hear from them at commencement, right, on stage. But if, is there an opportunity where we could have them also have some kind of platform in the same similar venue? So what we're gonna have, what we're gonna have is we're gonna have students introduce our speakers tonight. So Dr. Christine Brooms is gonna be first, and to introduce her, is Celeste Amos, who's going to come up here in just a second. Uh, Celeste is a previous Prairie State College student of uh, Dr. Brooms. She's an alumnus of Prairie State College, and then she ended up transferring on a transfer scholarship to major in biomedical engineering at the Illinois Institute of Technology, and now she works uh, at FM Global as, an, as a consultant engineer, which is really exciting. So without further ado, <laughs> Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us, and thank you for the applause. So I'm here today to introduce Dr. Christine Brooms, who I had the pleasure of meeting approximately five years ago. 
I was in her organic chemistry, chemistry class, and at the time, that was probably the most um, challenging course I've taken at the moment. And let me tell you, she's a tough cookie. You really, <laughs> you really have to earn your grade in the class. But the greatest takeaway from being in her class and my interaction with her is really the importance of building communication and that relationship with your professor outside of class and outside of the lecture. And I remember when I came to her and I told her, Dr. Brooms, I want to be an engineer. So I didn't get the typical response from her which was usually something along the lines of, wow, engineering is really challenging, or you know, it's a male-dominated field. But her response was encouraging, it was also supportive, and it was really about what is your plan, what are you gonna do next, how are you gonna reach your goal? And ever since then, I think that she's been a great factor and a great influence on my college career, which was no surprise to me that she got the, um, the Illinois Faculty of the Year Award, so congratulations. And who better to talk to us about how to better the influence and the impact that we have on each other here at Curry State College. So with that, please. A round of applause for Dr. Brown. there with 
you, they're listening to you, they're kind of following you, uh, um, following, uh, following along with you, and so then you can kind of teach them most anything, right? And so that was the biggest thing that we kind of took away, is that we need to find a way to, um, to connect with our students and to engage with them. And so, um, so, so part of that is seeing students for who they are, right? So part of when we walk into a class, we have our own selfish, um, our selfish goals, right? I want to impart my, my subject matter um, expertise to the students. I want them to all be little chemists, except that I realize they're not all going to be little chemists, right? So I need to see my students for who they are, and I need to understand their goals so I can help them to achieve whatever their goals are. It's not, it's not helpful for them if they achieve my goals. It has to be what they want to do. So many of my students will come in here, they'll hate chemistry, they'll never want to take another chemistry class again, but they'll need this chemistry class so that they can fulfill some requirement to go on and do something else. And I have to be totally okay with that. That has to be totally, I have to be okay with that. So if their goal is only to get a C in my class and to move on, I'm okay with that. If, they're glad, if their goal is to get an A in my class and then become a chem major, I'm definitely okay with that. <laughs> but I have to make sure that I understand what their goals are. And in order for me to understand what their goals are, I have to get to know my students. And I have to make sure that I get to know them um, really outside of the classroom, right? Because inside of the classroom, it's, you know, it's mostly me talking and you know, doing problems and things like that. But I need to have a three-dimensional view of who my students are and not just what they are on this two-dimensional thing that, that's on paper. All right, so that's kind of what I'm going to talk to you about um, today. And I read this paper, um, or it's, it's not a paper, it's an article. I read an article, it's from the Huffington Post, and the point of that article talked about um, the biases that we kind of bring into the classroom. And so it made me stop and think about, well, what are my biases? What biases do I bring into the classroom that can negatively impact my students? And then what biases can I bring into the classroom that can positively impact my students? And any negative bias that I have, I really want to turn it around to a positive. I want to see if I can switch that around and somewhat make it more positive so that I can connect better with my students. And so um, one of the things that I do is that I try to positively profile my students. So they walk in, I get the roster off of, uh, off of um, web advisor, and I'm kind of looking at their names, and based on their names, I can see you know, which ones are my international students, which ones are probably my Caucasian students, which ones are my black students, and then I'm trying to figure out, based on even just their names, what kinds of, um, what kinds of extra help will they need. So if they're students who are international students and they just got here, then likely they may need a little help navigating just the culture. They need to be able to acculturate themselves. And so I need to be able to help that. I need to be able to help to facilitate them doing that. And then uh, first day is a predominantly black institution. So for my Caucasian students, and I look around the, the classroom, and normally I have maybe about five out of 48, I don't want them to feel isolated. Because I know what it feels like to be isolated. I went to the University of Chicago, and I was one of the five, except the, the, the roles were reversed, right? I'm the only, I'm one of five black students. It was me, Nero, Allison, um, <laughs> John Dono, and then, uh, one other guy who turned the public policy, right? So there were five of us in our class, and I know them because I'm one of the five, you know what I mean? And so I don't want my students to feel isolated, and I don't want them to feel, excuse <coughs> me, I don't want them to feel left out. So I'm trying to figure out how can I, how can I positively profile them so that they can, they, that they can feel like they're part of this community. Um, and so I'll talk a little bit about, more about that um, in a minute. And so part of, when I see my students, and one of the things that Celeste said is that when, when she told me she wanted to be an engineer, it was just like, oh, okay, so what's your plan? And so the response that I gave her was much different than the response that I got when I was in, when I was in undergrad. And so one of the things that I, I'm going to tell you my story so that when you see students who look like me, you can understand what they could become, right? You can, you can look at them further down the line and say, oh, okay, she could possibly be a doctor room, or she could possibly not be a doctor room to be someone else. And so um, I grew up in Gary, Indiana. Uh, I, am my, uh, I grew up with a single parent. I have two other siblings. My brother, excuse me, my, uh, I have an older brother who passed away, and then I also have a sister. Um, I went to an underfunded, I was a student in an underfunded public school. Um, obviously, I'm female and African American. Um, I am a first generation college student as well. So all of those things kind of. Um, if we look at the, the literature out there, a lot of those things say they're going to be risk factors, right? That, oh, you know, all these things are kind of, would be seen as somewhat negative. 
right? And so the, the likelihood of me being a Dr. Rooms is probably low based on those things that I just listed. And the, the, um, the possibility of me actually standing on this stage today is even lower, right? So based on just those things. But the whole point is that those things do not define who I am, right? They're just a part of who I am. So when you're looking at your students and you're, you're kind of, you know, we, we see all this literature out there, we need to get a, a more holistic view of really who our students are and then who they actually can become. And so what those factors don't really say about me, excuse me, I'm, I'm, I'm okay. Um, <laughs> what what those, those factors don't say about me is they don't tell you anything about my drive. They don't tell you anything that I have a, uh, I had a praying mother who, even though she didn't go to college, she was going to make sure that I went to college if I wanted to. Um, my sister, well, my, my brother chose not to go to college, but that was totally fine, but she wanted to make sure that we had that opportunity. It says absolutely nothing about my, the grit that I have, right? None of those things are, are, are um, listed in those, those risk factors that, you know, people always try to talk about. And so based on, based on um, those things, there were three lessons that I want to kind of share with you. Um, two of the ones, well, actually all of them I learned from my mother. Um, the first one is that you have to turn that action, that potential into action, right? So I remember I'm going off to college and I'm talking to my mom and I'm like, oh, she's like, what school do you want to go to? And my story is I applied to one college, I applied early action because I was really too lazy to fill out the other applications. <laughs> and I figured that if I did not get into my first choice, then I would spend my winter break filling out all these other applications. Right? But I didn't, I didn't really feel like doing all, they didn't have the common application then. So I applied to the University of Chicago, and then my mom was like, well, why are you, why are you choosing that school? And it's like, oh, it's a good school, and I want to stay close. Well, why do you want to stay close? Oh, because I'm dating, you know, this guy I was dating at the time. <laughs> and then my mother kept saying, was like, well, why are you picking your schools based on him? I'm not really picking my schools based on him. There just happens to be this wonderful college that's very close to me, and he's also close too. And so, so my mother is, is, is talking to me, and she says, Christine, and I'm telling her, like, no, mom, he, he's going to do this, he's going to do this. And she's like, Christine, you're talking about his potential. What has he actually done? And I'm like, what? What do you mean? This is my guy. We're going to get married. It's going to be wonderful and great. And then she's like, Christine, he has not done anything yet. Once he turns his potential into action, then he can come and talk to you, and then you guys can drive off into the sunset. But as of yet, he has not done anything. And so that's when it dawned on me that I don't want to be a person about potential. I really want to be a person of action, right? And so, so that, that kind of... When I, when I come to um, either you know, my dean or my, my VP with something, I'm a person of action, so it's not this pie in the sky kind of thing. Normally when I come to you, I already have a plan. Right? <laughs> I have a plan, I have a strategy, I'm saying we're gonna do this and kind of let's go forward. So that was my, my first lesson. Um, the other thing that I, I learned, um, so I'm at the University of Chicago now, and my mother, uh, I call her, it's winter quarter. Winter quarter is brutal at UFC, it's brutal. The weather's awful, there's no sun, um, the classes are, are just seem like they're the hardest classes ever, all in the winter quarter. And so I call her, I'm crying. And I'm like, Mom, this stuff is too hard. I don't want to be here. I, I want to come home. And she says, without missing a beat, I'll get you an application for the post office. <laughs> what? I don't want to work at the post office. I don't have anything against postal employees, but I just didn't want to be one. And then I'm like, Mom, what are you talking about? I didn't say anything about the post office. She said, Christine, I can't help you with this chemistry, I can't help you with this calculus, but if you choose to come home, you have to work. And there's the, the post office is stable employment, you can come home and work at the post office. I'm like, but I don't want to work at the post office. She was just real quiet. And really what she was telling me, you need to choose your path. Now, you can choose whichever path you want. If you want to come home and work at the post office, I'm okay with that. If you want to stay there and figure out how to study this chemistry and this calculus and, 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 you know, and keep it moving, then you can do that as well. So I got off the phone. <laughs> open up my books, drive my tears off, and then I, I, I just realized that I, I'm just not going to be a postal worker, right? <laughs> I, don't have, I don't have anything wrong with postal workers, but that's just the whole point is that I can choose my own path, right? And so if I'm on a path that I don't really want to be on, I can choose immediately to go on a different path, but I have to be okay with those consequences. And so that was the second lesson that I, that I learned. And then the third one is just, just hard work and diligence. So I'm a runner. Um, I love running. And I love it when the runner in your mind kind of meshes up with the runner that's in the actual body that you have. You know, because that's sometimes few and far between. You know, you get out there and you, pic you picture yourself, you're a gazelle, and then you realize you're just a hippo just out there. <laughs> so there are a few times when the runner in your head and the runner in your body kind of meshes up. And so the thing that I like about running is that I can always measure my success very easily, right? A mile is a mile is a mile is a mile. 
how quickly I cover that distance is going to tell me kind of how successful I am. And I like that those, those metrics don't change. So that's a, a definite thing. You kind of get out there, you know, you, you, you hit the pavement, you run your mile, um, you overtrain so that you can run faster, you know, you, uh, <laughs> um, so you, uh, you overtrain, um, you learn diligence, you learn all this hard work, you learn all these great things just through, through running. And so all of those things kind of come together and, and it kind of makes me who I am today. And so um, I, I am definitely about action. Um, I definitely like to choose my path. So when I come into some place, I always have an exit plan. Um, and then I'm, I, I may not always be the smartest person in the room, but I will definitely outwork any of you all. That's just, I, mean, I, I, do, I have a great work ethic. Um, and so I try to impart these things to my students. And so, where am I going? <laughs> <coughs> Wait, where am I? Okay, so how do I how do I kind of bring this? Oh, I know where I am now. All right. So, so the, I tell you these things is because sometimes when we get students in our class, they may not look like us. They may have a completely different background than we do. But the whole thing, the the the, the point is, is that we never have the full story. And the only way we're going to get the full story is if we actually talk to our students. We have to make our students feel so comfortable that they can come to us and share their stories with us. And so if they can't do that, then that means we're only teaching a piece of the puzzle. And that means we're not gonna be effective, right? We wanna be really effective for our students. That means we have to get to know them. We have to know them outside of class. We have to actually be able to see them and say, oh yeah, I remember that story you told me about your brother or about your mother or about whomever so that I can really understand who this student is. And, and that'll help us to figure out really what their motivation is. Um, the, oh, on the other side, that's why. Um, so one of the things that I like to do is, like I said, I like to, I like to profile, um, where am I? I like to profile my students. And so when I see the students, so when my students first come to class, I give them this survey. I think many of you guys probably give them the beginning of the year survey. You try to figure out what their major is. You try to figure out what their goals are. Maybe if they have any barriers to their success. Um, <clears throat> And so when I look at those things and I see, does a student um, work a lot of hours? And most of our students do work a lot of hours, right? They need some money. And I don't look at that as a bad thing. What I see when I see that, what I think when I see that, is that this student is a hard worker. They're diligent. They have that grit. They're grinding. They're trying to really make this thing happen. Now, sometimes they're working so hard outside of class, they can't really spend as much time inside of class. But once I know that, I can have a conversation with them about that. When I see a student who has maybe three children under the age of five. I've been there, I know what that's like. Um, to me, that may seem like it's a barrier, but to them, that may seem like it's a source of inspiration. So I need to understand where they're coming from. So they don't see it as a barrier, I don't see it as a barrier either, and why should I? So I'm trying to make sure that what I think about them is actually true to, to how they truly believe what, what, you know, what they see in themselves. Um, when I see my students who are coming to class late, I don't lock them out. Right? I mean, I know some people, that's their policy because, you know, being on time and being prompt is a very important lesson to learn. But I know because many of them are catching the bus, the bus was late, whatever the case. But my whole point is that they're there. And I'm so happy that they're there. So if you're 30 minutes late, oh my gosh, you're 30 minutes late, but you know what? We still got another hour and 10 minutes to go. So we're going to take this time and I'm going to, you know, whatever you get in that hour and 10 minutes, whatever you missed in that first 30 minutes, if you want to come to my office hours a little bit later on, I kind of get you up to speed. But I'm happy that they're there. When I look out in my class and I see the, um, that there are, just, there are always just a few African-American men, um, which drives me crazy because we have such an opportunity here. So when I look out there and I see African-American men, and sometimes their pants are hanging down and, and you know all this stuff, but I'm looking at them and even though they may not be as polished as I would like them to be, they're here. So you know what? I can help to polish them. And by the way, pull your pants up because you're not going to walk around here showing your underwear. I don't want to see it. Nobody else wants to see it either. So I don't have a problem telling them that and I want to make sure that they know I'm telling you that, but I'm telling you that out of love. When I see the little young sassy girls and their you know, low cut shirt, I'd love that you have something to say. I want you to be able to share your, your, your thoughts, but I also want to be able to take you seriously. Don't come to my class again wearing those kind of clothes. It's unacceptable. And, and I, don't have, I don't think most of my students, they don't have a problem with me telling them that. I also have a student who I keep telling them I'm going to tie a rope around them pants if I see them like that again. But they're always hanging down low. And so I think that if, if the students know that you really, truly care about them, then they're okay with it. 
they're okay with the general corrections because they know that, oh, she really does care about me. She wants to see you know, me late, you know, later on. And so I, I realized that all of my students, I, the first day of class, I think that all of my students are capable of successfully completing my class. I positively, absolutely think that. Now, I know historically, all of my students do not successfully complete my class, right? Some of them get up, um, some of them drop. However, I teach the students who I know are, who, who are gonna get A's the same way, and I instill in them the same thing that the ones who I know are, are probably gonna end up dropping. The reason I do that is because one day, one of those students who actually stayed in my class may be a Dr. Broom, or one of those students who dropped out of class, like my mother went to, she took a few, a few classes at community <coughs> college at, um, at, at Indiana University uh, Northwest, and she wasn't able to finish, right? But the student who dropped could have been my mother. And so sometimes it takes a generation for, you know, to come full circle. So even though I may not be educating another Dr. Broom, I may, may be educating another Rebecca Edmund. That's my mother. And so when I think about that, I'm like, oh, this student dropped. But you know what? She, she's had such a positive experience that she's going to instill the same stuff in her kids. And so maybe her kids will then go ahead and be, and be college graduates. And so that's really when, when I'm looking out, I'm not looking at who you are today, I'm looking at who you can be. So I'm not looking at just this one student, I'm looking at this student as a mother, so she's gonna influence her or her kids. And then I'm looking at these children, this family then, is gonna influence a community. And so one of the reasons that I asked Celeste to, uh, to introduce me, because Celeste is a perfect example of that. So Celeste was in my class, um, Celeste has a beautiful daughter named Leandi, and her daughter was born, I think, while she was still in my class. And so Celeste would come and she's looking, you know, like new mother's look, you know? I'm just like, I'm gonna give her a shove because I realized that she stopped and she doesn't realize she stopped because she's sleeping standing up. Um, but when Celeste would call me and say, hey, you know, I can't make the class for whatever reason, that's fine. You know, this is the stuff that we're covering. Go ahead and try to read the stuff and then come to my office for a short mini lecture. So Celeste has since gone on and heard that she's graduated. Um, uh, from IIT, Celeste's husband is also a Prairie State graduate, and he's now in school doing health science at Chicago State University. Um, the other thing about Celeste, her experiences here has been positive, so her cousin was in our summer science program as a high school student, and then her cousin brought along some of their friends too, and then right now, currently, one of her other cousins is in my class right now. And so I think that when we, we, we need to really understand the impact that we have on our students. We're not just impacting a single person who happens to be whatever, the female, African American. You can really be influenced in a whole community. I mean, I think we can really turn Chicago Heights around. We can, we can make sure that, um, that our students have exactly what they need, and we can create a steady pipeline of even more students if we do our job correctly. And so I just want to make sure that you all understand what is your impact truly understand what your impact is here and know that you're not just impacting the students in your class, you're really impacting the entire community. So thank you very much. I've worked with Dr. Brooms for I think seven years now and I, and I think I've learned 10 times more about you as a teacher and as a person in those last 20 minutes, so kudos to you, that's awesome. So for our next presenter, I'm going to introduce um, the student uh, who's going to present, uh, Chad Belichstra. Um, Octavio Origel is a current Prairie State College student. He is the Vice President of the National Technical Honor Society, and he is a dental hygiene major, so he'll be a member of the, or a student in our dental hygiene program uh, forthcoming. He's a 3.7 GPA student who's a 2015 graduate from Bloom High School. So to introduce Mr. Bleachstrick, please give it up for Octavio Origel. <laughs> Chad Balistra, a man that wears many hats. <laughs> a firefighter and paramedic for the South Chicago Heights Fire Department, a business owner, faculty member at Perry State College, and most importantly, husband and father to two beautiful girls who resides here in Chicago Heights. Chad started his career here at Perry State College in 2008, instructing the fire science program and became the program coordinator in 2011. 
Chad started introducing the heating, ventilation, and air conditioning program in 2014 and was hired as a full-time faculty member in the fall of 2015. In his short involvement in the HVAC program, Chad has updated the curriculum to current standard um, industry standards and developed an internship program that will assist in job placement. Another highlight in, is the creation of a Spanish HBAC program, which shows that we are responsive for the needs of the community. Future plans for the program include de developing an associate's degree in HBAC and forming articulation agreements with schools for those students wishing to further their education in, in engineering. Mr. Dalitstra has been able to accomplish so much in a short amount of time at Prey State, which is why it is no wonder he was nominated as the Prey State College rep representative for the 2015 Illinois Community College Trustees Association Adjunct Faculty of the Year. So I present to you Professor Chad Dalitstra. for the third time this year, so that, that makes it even more interesting. Um, I came down with this on, I think it was Saturday, so perfect timing, right? So when I was thinking about uh, what I'm going to talk about, um, when Dr. Nays said, hey, would you be interested in this? I said, sure. I don't know what I'm going to talk about. Though. Um, so <clears throat> I started thinking about, again, uh, like Dr. Brooms uh, said, what's my audience going to be? So, um, thinking about some things that I can share with you guys, uh, common questions that I get just because uh, people hear that, oh, you do HVAC. Hey, I got a question for you. <laughs> so, uh, I'm, I'm, I've got a few minutes to share with you guys some, some things that uh, I think will, uh, hopefully, you guys will end up getting something out of this as far as, uh, you know, make, why maintenance is important and, uh, why, uh, you know, some common questions to answer, and uh, maybe some tips to help you save some money uh, before you call a service tech out. I'm trying to put myself out of work here. <laughs> Lord knows I do enough. <laughs> My wife would say that. <laughs> um, so, uh, how many, uh, let's take a stab. Does anybody have any idea besides you, George? <laughs> um, and one of the things I thought would be really interesting to talk about was, uh, you know, how to troubleshoot a variable speed blower motor, but I think George would be the only one that would be really interested in that. So, going through a couple courses in the program. Uh, so, so, I went with a safer topic here. Um, as far as your home energy efficiency, um, or your energy usage, your energy consumption in your home, uh, your heating and air conditioning, Anybody have any idea how what, what the percentage of that is in, in your total overall usage? Some numbers? Some shoot up. How many? 50. 70%. 70%, not quite that high. 50%. 50%. Uh, 46% on average, really good. <laughs> Were you looking at this? <laughs> um, next slide, slide showing this, and I know it shows up a little better up here. 46% uh, for your uh, furnace and your air conditioner. Uh, another 13 with your water heater. So when we look at you know things that, that we take care of um, as far as HVAC is concerned, 60% um, of the energy usage in your home. Um, we all know that gas and electric aren't getting any cheaper, uh, for, although gas is down a little bit right now. But uh, you know just a little graph that shows kind of where where this stuff uh, where, where we're spending our money at in our in our home. One of the biggest things that you guys can do to save money is install a programmable thermostat. Okay, <laughs> the uh, Department of Energy, and this is where these facts are from, if you turn down your thermostat one degree Fahrenheit for uh, eight hours, that's gonna give you a 1% savings, okay? Now, <clears throat> there are so many different types of thermostats that are out there and technology is crazy. How many, how many people have smartphones? my daughter was here, she'd be raising her hand. She thinks she has one. <laughs> um, but uh, 
the, a lot of the modern thermostats, just by replacing your thermostat, and I don't even know what kind of furnace or air conditioner that you have, but just by replacing your thermostat, you can save as much as 20%. How is that possible? Well, look at the different types of thermostats that are up there. The one all the way on the top left is what uh, maybe a lot of you guys have at home. It's just the old round dial, nothing's adjustable. You know, when you leave, when you leave home for, you know, uh, eight hours a day, your, your thermostat just sits at whatever temperature that you set it at. Um, then we have some, the one below that, uh, all the way over on the left, it's just a standard programmable thermostat. We can set different times in there to cut it down, but it depends on, you know, who's home. If, if you have kids that are in and out of the house, they're going to start complaining that it's too cold. Well, now they started coming out with these smart thermostats that will actually have what they call occupancy sensors that will sense that you're, that you're home. It will sense that you're in a specific room. Um, leading over to um, couple, everything over there other than the, the two on the left, all those are you know, the smart thermostats that you can control through your phone. So that, that's another neat option. When you leave the house, you can control it from your, your smartphone. Now, if you don't feel like doing that, because although that may seem cool at the, at, in the beginning, it does tend to be a little bit of a pain in the butt to keep <laughs> scheduling through this, and oh yeah, let me turn this back down. So that's where um, the two thermostats that are uh, on the, the bottom right there, and the one right above it, uh, Honeywell Nest and uh, the Ecobee is what they call them. Um, right now, there's a, uh, you, can, you can find these thermostats for about 150 bucks, and ComEd's giving you a $100 rebate on it. So, look at the money that we're saving here, you know, potential savings on this. Um, what's really neat about those two thermostats is they have this uh, feature in there called geofencing. So it's still hooked up to your phone, but it senses when you leave the house and it will go ahead and kick your thermostat down. So, um, it'll, and you set how much you want it to kick it down to. So, like, I've got mine set down to five, five degrees and my wife has the same, uh, actually, I don't know that you do have that on your that's probably why you complain about it. <laughs> now that I'm thinking about that, the temperature's always fine when I'm home. <laughs> well, well, that was awkward. <laughs> so, um, we'll, we'll work on that. Um, but uh, it, it's really neat because you can set that what that setback's going to be, and when you get within two miles of the house, uh, two miles of your home, you've got your smartphone with you. It'll go ahead and kick that on. So, some really neat things. Um, how many of you have, uh, in your house, man, I've got a, kind of a chilly room when I sleep. Okay, again, an awesome option. You know, we can talk about some different options about upgrading your equipment and what kind of equipment we can get. But the, the Ecobee, that one that's in the bottom right, it's got a little wireless sensor there that you can place in a room. And what that'll do is it'll sense that somebody's in there and you can sense a time, you set a time period for what you want that to, to be set at. So again, when you're sleeping, you want it to be comfortable in that those specific rooms. It'll say, hey, I want it set at 70, but it's 66 in here. It's gonna kick your furnace on so it's 70 degrees in that specific room. And I know what some of you might be thinking, hmm, if it's gonna be 70 in that room, what's it gonna be downstairs? Yes, it is going to be a little bit warmer downstairs, but are we more concerned about when we're sleeping, being comfortable, or what it is downstairs? So again, kind of a, a cheaper fix to some issues like that, but there's a more uh, global fix that we can do by replacing some, some of that equipment with some other specific type of equipment. So just a really easy way to save some money right there. Um, another easy way to save some money is to fix air leaks. And these are all things that any one of you guys can do out here. Just, you don't need a service tech to come in there and do this, although you'd be happy to do that. Um, air leaks can account for 30% less airflow. Um, so we want to make sure that we're, we're keeping that airflow and we're, we're letting that airflow be um, directed to where we want it and not specifically you know, in the crawl space or in an attic. So by insulating, by um, taping up those ducts to make sure that we don't have any air leaks. Um, easy way that we can do this, and I tell customers if they want to take on this challenge, because this can be um, quite expensive to have a contractor come in there and do something like this, because <clears throat> it's, it's time consuming to do this. So if you spend a little bit of time, you can uh, get little incense uh, sticks, turn your, uh, turn your furnace on, and then go by the, the ducts, that are in question 
and you can see where if you start blowing incense throughout the house and you start smelling that, you know where the where the ducts are leaking from, right right where the uh, leaks are at. So just they buy uh, they sell tin tape. Um, it's specifically for HVAC at at uh, Home Depot, Menards, any of them. You go there and pick up a roll of that and, and uh, seal that duct work up. Uh, we talked about the insulating ducts. This bottom one here. I don't know if I can. Put, make a billboard and put something out, but uh, you know, springtime's coming. We'll be doing a lot of cleaning checks out there. And when I go out to customers' homes, find out that oh, you, you planted a bunch of stuff around your air conditioner. That looks nice, but <laughs> <laughs> what is that doing? Number one, I can't get there, but well, I don't want to see that thing. But it's necessary for us for that system to be able to breathe properly. So we need to make sure that. Everything stays clean around that area. They, you know, the manufacturer. This isn't this isn't Chad up here talking. This is the manufacturer saying, 24 inches. Uh, pretty much everybody says the same thing. Clear in all directions, it's because the the coil that you see that's on the outside is what what brings the air in. It's what sucks the air in, and then it discharges out the top. It needs to be able to do that, um, have that have that uh, cycle happening. Um, when we have that cottonwood that uh, starts flying around. Um, even the customers that I do seasonal cleaning checks on, I tell them, you know, to avoid another service call, having, having me, you know, come out in a couple months when that cottonwood starts flying, just take your hose, you know, and, and rinse that off because that will, that will stop your airflow. It's just like putting bushes or shrubs right in front of all your stuff. Um, don't make the system work so hard. Keep the, if you want, if, you know, keep the blinds closed, install blinds, you know, depending on what side of the house, you know, if you're on your, the, the south side exposure there. Um, close the blinds during the day, during the warmest parts in the afternoon, because that's where we're getting our hottest sun there. Um, so if we can block what's coming in, we can stop that heat loss uh, from, from leaving our uh, uh, temperature controlled space. Um, a lot of customers I see want to shut down ducts because of that issue that I have a cold room. Well, that oftentimes, by shutting down ducts, will go ahead and complicate that issue because there's pressure that's within those ducts that, need, that needs to be maintained. So if we shut too many of them registers down when we're, when we're uh, trying to, trying to you know, force more air to a specific room of the house, ends up creating an additional issue for us. Um, so we want to be careful about what we're dampering down. Um, the other big thing is to have that system serviced annually. Again, manufacturer's recommendations and any of them out there to make sure that, I mean, that, that's a huge expense. That's a huge homeowner expense is replacing your furnace and air conditioner. So we want to make sure that we maintain that. You know, we take our car in for oil changes. We want to make sure that we're bringing our, our you know, taking our furnaces and we're cleaning our furnaces and our air conditioners to maintain them to get that life, ex life expectancy out of it. So, <clears throat> Couple uh, pictures there, and I know with the lights and everything, it may be a little difficult to see. But um, <clears throat> one of the one of the big questions that I have when you guys do decide to make that, you know, hey, um, I, I'm I'm ready to make that purchase. Um, I think almost every install that I've done when I go out to the, the homeowner's house, when I bring the new furnace in, they say, uh uh. <laughs> I'm not, you're not putting that little thing in here <laughs> because they make things that are much more compact now. Um, but they are much better, the, the, the features that they have. I'm not going to you know, bore you guys all with those details, although I'd be more than happy to talk to you if you were interested in something like that, um, you know, if you're working with a contractor or whatever. But you know, to, just to, just to, um, you know, to look at that, you've know, you got you to be comfortable at trusting your uh, HVAC service tech there. Um, they're making stuff a lot smaller, a lot more compact. This is probably the number one cause of um, service calls. And this is industry-wide. This isn't just you know, what I go out there and I see. Is dirty filters. I've been in a new homeowner's house. Um, some of the guys that I work with at the firehouse, when, hey, you, when's the last time you had your furnace or air conditioner clean? Uh, yeah, we've been there three years. What kind of, you changing your filter? My what? <laughs> and I'm not kidding you. It's been, there's been times where I've went out there and it's been, I don't, I don't even know I had filters. Wow, okay. So making sure you know where your filter's at and how to replace it. Another big question that I get is, 
Um, is, is that it, you know, how, how important is that? So <clears throat> these are just some of the things here. Number one, system uh, uh, failure there. If we're not moving that airflow, we're not getting to that design, um, the design temperature uh, that we're looking for across that uh, furnace there. So if we have issues with that, it's not gonna operate properly. Reduces the air quality in your home. That has a lot to do if we have allergies, um, we're you know, not, not feeling well, um, check your filter. Look at, look at the filter that's on there. Um, make your system work harder and it's gonna make it essentially fail faster because it's working harder, it's working longer. It increases your energy um, consumption uh, dramatically because what happens, in, uh, it's gonna cause your system, if it's supposed to work for eight minutes, it'll end up working for 30 minutes to work for that eight minutes because it's only able to work for a minute and a half at a time because it'll start overheating. Um, and we don't wanna do that. Um, Especially when we start doing that stuff, uh, when, we, when we start overheating our, our equipment, not good. It's going to cause premature failure on there. So which filter should I buy? <clears throat> another, another big, uh, big question. Um, they have standard washable filters that you can use. Um, not very good. It's, it's good at catch, catching some um, of the dust. Um, it's only catching large particles. It's not catching the really small stuff, the allergens and the pet, the pet dander if we, if we have got pet issues. Um, the one on the right there is just the standard, you know, 49, 59 cent filter. Um, these are all like the MERV ratings on there, and that's how they, that's how they rate them. Uh, it's the minimum efficiency reporting value. Um, just a standard fil filter. We start getting into the pleated where they're real dense right there. Um, that, we can get a one inch filter that can be something all the way up to a MERV uh, 11 off of those little filters there, which is gonna start catching a lot of allergens, a lot of pet dander. Um, filters do make a ton of difference um, in, in, in replacing, uh, uh, going with a pleated filter opposed to a, a standard uh, disposable filter. Um, and then the media filters. So all those, those other three filters, um, changing them once, uh, once a month. The thicker filter, we can change that uh, twice a year. So it's a little bit more expensive, but they work much better. Um, they're able to catch much, they're able to uh, filter that air and clean that air. So a couple things that, uh, you know, to, to wrap this up a little bit, a um, couple things that we can check before uh, calling a service tech out. So come home and you find that your furnace, your air conditioner is not working. Um, does it have power going to it? How do you know? Most, most furnaces now have little lights that are on the bottom, um, a little, uh, little um, round hole that's in the bottom panel that'll have a little LED light that blinks. Um, that tells us as the technicians what's wrong with that. Um, look in there for that little light, see if that's on. Uh, you can check any breakers, make sure that uh, <coughs> you want to uh, look for any breakers that may, may be tripped. So just go to your breaker box, any, anything look like it's not the same as the rest of them, um, go ahead and you, know, you can try to reset that. Um, if it is a significant problem with the system and it trips it right away, as soon as you, trip, as, as soon as you turn it on, then you need to call a service tech. Don't, don't try to uh, continue uh, flipping that. Um, gas, is the gas on? Do you have kids in the house where they playing with the gas valve? Um, it, it's happened many times. Um, playing with the electrical switch, you know, the, the, the power switch on there. So, Again, just some easy, easy checks on there. How's your filter? If the system's running but it's not performing, take a look at the filter, pull it out, take a look at it. Does it look like it, need to get re it needs to get replaced? Let's go ahead and replace that. Uh, batteries and the thermostats. Most thermostats now will tell you, hey, you've got a little battery. It'll have a little picture of a battery in there. Go ahead and replace those batteries in there. Um, see, if, see if that, if, if you're getting nothing working on the system, that, that may fix your problem. Uh, the disconnect switch, and this is talking about the air conditioner outside. Um, sometimes the, uh, we'll find the disconnect switches that, that's all that's wrong with the system outside. Somebody had shut it off, you know, doing some gardening, whatever, outside. The HVAC uh, technician that was out in the, the fall. Some, sometimes I have customers that I know I'm coming out in the spring and they want me to go ahead and shut it down, cover up their unit, um, all that good stuff. So make sure that that's on. Uh, condensate pump. Um, there's a pump that's next to the uh, next to the uh, furnace because you don't want to have this PVC drain um, over your laundry room or wherever it may be. Make sure that that's just functioning properly. Is it plugged in? 
And then um, the safety switches, those are usually uh, work with each other, to, just to make sure that those are tied in with each other. Um, is, everything, is everything operating properly with that? Um, that's what I have for you. <laughs> so, Take some questions if you guys have any questions. <laughs> You're still talking to me, class. <laughs> yes. Do you wear that suit when you teach? Absolutely. No. <laughs> <laughs> As I said, when I was getting dressed, I'm like, I don't get to dress up much. I'm usually in jeans and a polo. <laughs> Does yes. anybody like better being a firefighter or an HVAC technician? You know what? They're both awesome. <laughs> um, and and, I, and I'm, I'm not just saying it because we have some administration sitting here. Um, I really do. You know, being being a firefighter, um, we have this thing in the in the fire service called the Brotherhood, and I really feel like you know it's a family oriented uh, environment, and I really do feel like this is a family oriented environment here, um, just with the support and everything, and how close knit everybody is. Being a, a smaller school. And I really do love it. So both of them, they do. It's the best of both worlds. Last <laughs> question. So my question is a little, so, so I bought a new uh, air conditioning unit maybe a couple of years ago, and it's huge. And it's much bigger. So you know how you just said that most things are getting smaller. Why is mine so big? Did I just get gout? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it was really expensive too. Did Yikes. I just get gout? Well, <laughs> the, thing with, the thing with furnaces, the furnaces are smaller. The air conditioners, they are making better, bigger because um, of the energy efficiency rating on them. They're much larger. Um, your old, um, just to sort of break down there, your old air conditioner, I could probably say when it was running, was probably pulling about 20 amps, which is like having 40 light bulbs on. Uh, your new uh, air conditioner when it's running is probably pulling half of that. And that's the reason. It's a much larger, larger coil that's in there and a, a much better compressor that's in there. So air conditioners do, the, the higher efficiency that you get with those, the taller and bigger that they do get. Okay. All right, that makes me feel so, so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to go home and call your service time. I've already, hey. I kind of already did, but I just didn't, you know, at this point I was like, I don't know if I even trust you anymore, so. But it's, it's fine. I should probably call them and call Yes. What is the typical life expectancy of a furnace or an AC unit, and what brands would you recommend? About uh, typical life expectancy unit is about 15 years, and that's kind of generalizing here. A kind of uh, trade rule that's out there is if you're looking at repairing your furnace and you don't know if you should replace it, so I do, do I repair or do I replace? Um, typically. Um, it's, if the repair is going to cost more than $500 and it's more than 10 years old, you should consider replacing the, the furnace on there. Now, that's not saying that your furnace isn't going to last 35 years because I've seen, I, I know of a furnace that's still working that was put in in the 60s. So, I mean, it's not very energy efficient by any means. <laughs> <laughs> um, but just stubborn, hey, come out and check this every year. We really need to replace yeah, this. I'm here. <laughs> I wasn't going to call you out that It's only 25 years old. So, yeah, th that's generally the, the rule there with, with repair and replace. Um, as far as brands, I mean, there's. I'm not going to sit up here and talk bad about one or the other. Um, everybody, they, they all have their pros and their cons. What I will say is typically when you go with the, the, the top of the line, the carrier, the train, um, I'm not a big fan of installing them. I can't install them. I'm not a dealer with them. The, the problem that I see with those is they are extremely high efficiency um, and they do use very little energy, but when they break, they are super expensive to repair. So looking at a, a long-term investment for the homeowner, you will have to do repairs on your furnace or your air conditioner. You know, that, that's a given. So looking at that, when I have to replace a draft inducer motor, let's say on a, on a carrier ultra high efficiency furnace, some of them are upwards of $1,000. So that's just for me to purchase that. And now I have to purchase it and put it in and you know try to hand a homeowner a bill for you know, $1,200 and they're like, what the heck? I just, 
it, mm -hmm. this is only seven years old. Mm -hmm. um, so I typically, uh, I'm, an, I'm an Arco Air dealer. There's really only five manufacturers of furnaces and air conditioners out there, and everybody's made by somebody. Mm -hmm. So um, it's just another another different line that they have. Um, and uh, it's the brand that I install is is on the same, they're made at the same plant in uh, the carrier, although they're closing it down, it wasn't Indianapolis. But they were, they're made at the same exact plant, they just put different stickers on them, and they do use different parts. The brand that I use, I, you know, I can go to any supply house and pick up almost any part to it, so it's more universal. So that's why, that's why I chose to stick with uh, that specific brand. Yes? For efficiency, can you get out of dampers? Out of dampers? Uh, you're really not getting efficiency. You're directing airflow with that. Oh, uh, so like you yeah. have a yeah. Yeah, and, and, and there's a there's a balance game that you can play with that. You know, to, to shut some down, um, open them up. You just want to. And again, the general rule of thumb is no more than three registers. You know, shutting down in the standard home. Does it be like a special thermom? I mean, No, um, what I do when I go out there and do it, I have a little thing that plugs into my smartphone, yeah. um, and it's got a little fan on it, and it'll tell me how much CFM, which is how much air is blowing through that one register. Mm -hmm. So, and that's how we can adjust based on, you know, look at the room size and say, how much CFM should this room be getting, and now I can adjust it based on that. So they call that balancing. Good question. So why is George so excited about this two-stage air conditioner? Yeah, I'm kind of obsessed. I'm kind of obsessed with it. What's that? I'm kind of obsessed with the two-stage air conditioner. The nice thing about I don't, I don't fully understand it, but it just seems great. And I, every, I would come home from your class every night. Like just well, you know how uh, Christine was all excited about chemistry yeah. and tape. She was talking about tape. Yes. That was me talking about the Tuesday. And I, I mean, she understands. This. I don't even understand it. I was so excited. About it. <laughs> and Christine got pretty sick of that pretty quick. But anyway, <laughs> tell, really us, neat tell us why it's so great. The really neat thing about um, two-stage air conditioning is is two things. It's energy consumption, um, so much less energy that it uses, and also better temperature control. Your air conditioner, when it works, is when it first turns on, is first removing the humidity from your home. And then it starts to cool. So if we can remove the humidity, it'll, it'll cool at, at a much um, higher temperature, as long as we can keep that humidity around 50%. The thing with the two-stage air conditioner, when it first kicks on, all it does is removes the humidity from the house. It, much, it removes it at a much lower speed, uses um, probably about the same Electricity is four light bulbs being on, so hardly anything. So that's the huge energy savings with that. Is nine times out of ten, if you're just looking at maintaining your, um, uh, maintaining the temperature in your home, it can run at that first stage, which is going to run at you know two or three amps, hardly anything, um, and it's going to give you a much more comfort control because it's controlling that humidity. There's very little cooling that's actually happening, so. Um, for the elderly, that's an awesome option because a lot of elderly say, you know what, I really don't like the air conditioning because I don't like being cold. Well, that's fine, but this is a great option for you because now I, if we can control the humidity, maybe 78 degrees and 50% humidity is perfect. So it's, 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 um, I'm the, it's more expensive. <laughs> it is more expensive. Um, it's, yeah, it's a, a few hundred dollar option to, to go with that. but. Um, in, in the long run, it's, a, it, it's money well spent. Um, one of the last things that... Um, See, I think the crowd is about as excited as Christina was. But I'm excited about it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so excited about it. I just lost everybody. I know, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, <we're> going. <laughs> um, You're better than Little Man for Dini. It's your own show. <laughs> um, <laughs> the last thing that uh, um, I, I just want to leave you guys with is how do we effectively communicate with, um, with customers as far as um, when we're selling equipment, when you have your HVAC guy, because 
all of you guys have your own HVAC guys that you're working with, and that's not my idea. Is up here to say, hey, call me. But <laughs> when you guys look at, <laughs> when you, <laughs> <laughs> um, but I'll be more than happy to answer any questions for you. Um, <clears throat> when you're looking at replacing your equipment, when it comes time to talk about that, um, I think one of the one of the things that we try to teach in our program with our students is a lot of customer service and how to talk with the customer and how to deal with the customer because. You know, I don't want to say that those are some of the soft skills, but you know, it's not a technical skill. It's an essential skill that they need to have. Um, but when we, when one of the things that we explain to the students is, when you start talking about replacing equipment, um, energy efficiency. When you look at 90, 80 percent efficient, 90 percent efficient, 96 percent efficient, we're talking about your furnace. What does that mean? Equate that to dollars spent. So for every dollar you spend you see on an 80% efficient furnace, 20 cents of that going out the chimney. For every dollar you spend on a 96% efficient furnace to heat your home, you're only losing 4% of that, uh, 4 cents out of every dollar. So just something to kind of keep in the back of your head about, you know, how, how long am I going to, you know, how long are you going to stay there? That's something that's important, and, you know, whether you upgrade from a standard to a high efficiency furnace. Um, but that's something to kind of put, you know, if you grab somebody's pocketbook, you kind of got their attention. <coughs> so, any other questions? I don't know what we have. All right, thank you, guys. All right. So, I don't know about you, but I feel exhilarated, right? So, um, I want to say again, thank you for coming. Let's do two quick things. Number one, let's give a nice round of applause to our student presenters. Tonight. <laughs> and so let's give another big round of applause to both Mr. Belistra and to uh, Dr. Broom. <laughs> so this is one of, those one of those many potential opportunities for us. We all know that Prairie State College has a unique story to tell. And I think we saw with our students and certainly with our faculty presenters tonight that they are a really, really significant <coughs> chapter in that story. So let's continue that. If you enjoyed this, let's spread the word and then we'll do it again next April. Sound good? <laughs> we have a question.